December 21st at 7 p.m., a service of remembrance and a service designed for those who are grieving or having a hard time with the holidays. Everyone's welcome to come, and that's pretty awesome. After the Advent candle uh, reading, the kids are dismissed. Yay! Today we relight the candle of hope and peace, and now we also light the pink candle which represents joy. Luke chapter 1, verses 30 to 38. The angel said to her, Don't be afraid. Mary, you have found forever with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne and the father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. The kingdom will never end. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. For no words from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May our words be to me the be filled. Then the angel left her. Luke chapter 2, verse 10 to 12 and verse 19. The angel said to the shepherds, do not be afraid. I bring you good news and will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. It is not only for peace that the spirit visits our listening, but for the promise. All this barrenness Anticipation, hope, and word of peace in the story of Advent is drawing us towards a profound and cosmos-shaping revelation. Christ is arriving to us, but it is not, it is no small thing that he arrives himself as a seed sown into the darkness of our lives, carried in the womb of humanity. God divine, God's divine vision is one that grows up in our minds. As ordinary and common as any of the rest of us, Christ is the same with you and I today. You too are invited to hold Christ and his promises within us, growing in the midst of our daily living as hidden miracles, anticipating their full birth of God's timing. That's the great beauty of Advent. God has come to us and is in our midst. Like Mary, we're invited to ponder those things in our hearts as we carry the presence of Christ in each season and in every place of need. Because if living, listening lives, we'll, we'll hear God saying to us in many little ways that we too conceive and give birth. Luke 1 verse 31. Through the scripture, a visit of God's joy to the heart, a passing comment in a conversation with a friend, or through the line in a book or a song. God speaks to our everyday needs and longings. All these little messages are meant to stir anticipation, to alert us and to, to begin open us up. Each one awakens us to a bigger picture the expectation of change, the arriving presence within us of his love. And it's through his practice of holding God's promise within us and living into them that true spiritual joy springs up. Because joy is living in the delight of what God is going to do as much as what he already is. It's prophetic that way, that kind of joy like God's peace 
is transcendent because it can live untouched by the taunts and terminalities of this world. It's not based on what we experience today, but on who God is and what he has said he will do. Be thy biblical promises of Christ's ultimate victory or his own personal word to us today. By calling them to memory and holding them within our hearts, we can more fully live in the joy that God is and will arrive to us. Yes, Christ is coming, but in Mary's story we discover he's already here, sown in our midst, growing up with us, pouring out his peace and love. Please pray with me. As we consider this Christmas and the presence of Jesus in our lives, what little messengers has God sent to you that are a source of joy? Allow the joy of the presence of Jesus to fill you today. Heavenly Father, help us to see and notice the places in and around us where your miracle is growing up, awakening to holy ordinariness and inhabiting Advent joy. Amen. Children, you're dismissed. You may meet your teachers in the back. Born in Bethlehem, come and worship.
worship. Do not be afraid. A company of angels, glory in the highest. On the earth, peace and love. Those who will be saved are men. Amen. Before we go into a time of prayer, um, as the goofball on staff, I just got to be honest, you guys look beautiful. And I'm not lying for a change when I say that. I mean, even Alex over here, if you didn't catch the joke over here, last week we did pajama day and he came dressed with anything but the sweater and he won the sweater for having the best pajamas. And I told everybody in front of everybody that he has to dress like this next week. And I forgot until you walked in. <laughs> 
we've already had our picture. It was a glorious morning, but really, we can talk about the beauty. We can talk about the happiness. A lot of your shirts just have made me laugh today. We have Kevin screened up here in the front. Some of you who have gone so far to have bells and added music, hopefully you danced in rhythm today. Um, but really, it's beautiful. But we also recognize we do these candles week in and week out to remind us that there was an unbelievable need for joy. There was an unbelievable need for hope and peace and love that we've been talking about and we'll talk about. There was a need for Christ. And for across, across the room, that's the reality for all of us, is that there is a need for us, whether it's in joy or in hope or in peace or in love, that we need what Christ brings to us. And so we're going to go to time of prayer, recognizing that's some of your prayer lists. You have the prayer list in your bulletin that's online. For those of you who don't know that, you can find that online as well. But you need that. And some of you also need to sit down. So I'm going to invite you to do that um, while I lead us in prayer. Lord, I praise you and thank you. That when I think about Christmas and all the things that we do to prepare for Christmas, Lord, you prepared on day one. That your intent was always the same. It never faded and never altered, altered, nor it never changed. Was to breathe life into your creation, specifically into humanity. And to not just give us a life to live, but a life worth living. And sometimes for each and every one of us, that becomes difficult to determine what does that even look like. Lord, and we can step into this season each and every year, both, Lord, in our joys and in our sorrows, and we can declare our praises, Lord, to you today that we will magnify the Lord. Why? Because he has done such great things for me. Or how many of our old hymns we are reminded of that were written like it is well as my soul in troubled times. And Lord, today I praise you and thank you, Lord, that as we come to gather into your space, on even in the upper room as we foreshadow ahead and the Advent season is expecting Jesus to come once and expecting him to come twice, Lord, that you told your disciples even the day that you would be leaving, that the one thing you left them in the midst of what he acknowledged was a troubling season was my peace I give you. And Lord, today, while peace might have been last week, Lord, today I seek for all of us as we talk about joy. As we have to embark upon a difficult week, I know Trisha's family just tomorrow is having to s celebrate her cousin's life, the young age of 23, going on to be with her Savior. So Lord, we pray for her and we pray for those who have to work through this season of loss. That Lord, that you would help us by your grace and your grace alone. Look at the Christmas lights. Look at the ugly Christmas sweaters. Worn in church of all places, and be filled with the joy that comes from knowing that Jesus has come, He has gone ahead of us, and He's coming back to bring each and every one of us home. So, Lord, today we praise you. Today we magnify your holy name because you have done great things for us. And I pray, Lord, today, even for this week ahead of us, that you would go before us, preparing us, Lord, for whatever's ahead of us with the joy, the peace, and the hope, and the love that we know we get this season because we believe in the beautiful, powerful name of Jesus. And it's in that name we pray today. And all God's people said, amen, amen. You know, as Pastor Jason said there, even though this is called the most wonderful time of the year, um, for some people there are hard things about this season. And that's what the blue Christmas service is intended uh, to do. It's to create a quiet, safe space for those who need to acknowledge that there are some things where it's hard to be joyful. Um, those who have suffered loss or grieving, uh, and it doesn't even have to be this year. Or maybe it's just, this is a stressful season and you need a quiet place to just acknowledge that, that you need peace. Uh, that's what that service is attended, intended for. And, and if it's not for you, that's okay. I mean, you don't, I'm not going to twist your arm to come. But, but it can be a memorial service if you just want to remember someone. Um, and it can be a, a time of just acknowledging that, Lord, I need you because I lost my job. Or I'm grieving because... We can't be together as a family this year. Whatever it might be, um, that's what that service is intended for. Uh, and then I want to just say a public thank you. Um, so this week, 
Um, I was at the hospital, and uh, it was for, not me, but for someone else for a small procedure. And uh, while we were there, um, we saw Julie Kritzer, and uh, it just brought me peace. Uh, and she was just there working. I mean, it, she, you know, was there doing her job and seeing her, and she came up to us. She saw us, and she smiled, and uh, it took me a minute to place the person because I'm used to seeing her here, and seeing you all outside of this room, I always have to take a moment to be like, wait, who is this? Oh, yeah. And it was just nice, you know, to, to have that calming presence. And so thank you for seeing us and coming over and saying hi. So I just appreciated that. And then you are the one in your family who's wearing Christmas stuff. So uh, kudos to you for that as well. Uh, this morning, we are continuing in our Advent theme, This Darkness Will Not Last. And as a reminder, the word Advent means arrival. And people had been waiting for a long time for the arrival of the Messiah, for Jesus to come. And the first Advent, the first arrival, is what we celebrate at Christmas, that Jesus was born, and then the anticipation that we still celebrate and we look forward to the return of Jesus, and that is the second Advent. And waiting for the arrival of a long-expected baby is not easy. And now the people, they maybe didn't know what exactly they were waiting for, but they knew that they were waiting for something. And I recall uh, during our parenting lives, Trish and I, there was a season where um, she was pregnant with Amos, and she had some early contractions. We're talking like 10 weeks early, something like that, 9 weeks early, 12 weeks early. See, my math is not, uh, I wasn't the mom. So, But she had what was considered a high-risk pregnancy anyways due to previous C-sections and, and miscarriages, and so we were anticipating this little one, and we went for an ultrasound early on, and one of the real answers to prayer, one of the cool things is that, um, and I've maybe shared this before, but so uh, all of the other pregnancies had been on one side of her womb. We'll just, uh, we'll be biologically vague, but she had, her womb was shaped like a heart. It has a, a half wall in it. That's not normal. That's a, a birth thing that she was just born with that. And so it was a crowded space, if you will. Uh, all of our sons had to be born a little early, probably because it was a crowded space. They grew too big for that area. And they had all been on one side, and so the wall of the womb had thinned to the point where she was considered high risk because it could rupture. And if that happens, it's very serious for the mom and the baby. And so, because she went into uh, early labor, early contractions, she had to be basically within like 20 minutes or less of a hospital that could handle it. At the time, we lived in Bloomington, and she had to come up here and live essentially across the street from University Hospital uh, here in Indianapolis. So for roughly nine to 10 weeks, uh, the three boys and I were home while Trish was here waiting for Amos. And the reason we chose Amos's name uh, this is just an aside, so you know this. Um, he was, when we went to one of the ultrasounds, and the doctor said, you're not going to believe this. Um, he's on the other side. All your pregnancies were on the one side where the wall is thinned. He's on the other side. I believe he said uh, he gets that new car smell, so to speak, uh, which is a little crude, but nevertheless, you get the idea. And the name Amos means carried by God. And we just felt like, wow. I mean, how can that be other than the Lord stepping in, right? But I recall what it was. The, the point of this story was I recall what it was to attempt to be patient as you wait for the arrival of a baby. And attempt to be patient when the situation is not ideal. And you really need this one to come. And you need the situation to get better. And that's how the people felt. The people who were in darkness is what the verse says. We'll read in a moment. They were, they were waiting. And waiting is hard. We don't like to wait, do we? 
We don't like to wait. We are a people who don't like to wait. And, and that's not a new phenomenon. People do not like to wait. And the people of Israel had been waiting centuries, a lot longer than nine weeks for the arrival of this Messiah. Would you read Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2? The people... That is the message for you today. Some of us are feeling that darkness for whatever reason. But the promise of Advent is that this darkness will not last. Would you say that together with me, the words on the screen? This darkness will not last. Now, I don't do this often, but turn to someone next to you and tell them this darkness will not last. It's always interesting to me to see which one is your favorite, who you turned to, and who you ignored. (laughs) There, I just started an argument in half the homes. That's what I do as a pastor because I love you. A quick reminder, next Sunday, we will hear from our choir, including the teens and the kids. As Ace said, it's going to be a great morning of worship and celebration. And I promise that just like I believe every Sunday there is a message for you I believe that next Sunday in the service, there is a message for you through the songs, through the worship, through the readings. uh, God is going to speak to us. And as another reminder, the next three Sundays, we do not have Grow Deep in the morning. So the 930 Grow Deep time, we do not have. It'll just be the 1030 service. So if you come next week for Grow Deep, you may get drafted into the choir because they'll be in here rehearsing. So And if you're not a singer, then you're just going to end up having to help wrangle the kids. So that's just your warning. Uh, Or I'll make you serve coffee. So today, we are continuing the theme of Advent as we then look into Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. So would you read uh, this text for us as well? For... As another just neat aside here, um, if you've ever heard of Handel's Messiah, one of the great uh, works of uh, Christian music, um, that's one of the primary focuses of his work is that verse. And it's uh, uh, some of you have been here long enough, you remember Bishop and Superintendent Joe James. Um, I rode in a car with him for several hours once to a pastor's meeting and we listened to Handel's Messiah the whole time because it is one of his absolute favorite pieces of music. And I saw a side of Joe that I had never seen before. He just loved explaining to me the depth of the music. And it gave me this great respect for his love for the Lord. If you've never heard it, uh, it may not be your cup of tea, but it is a great uh, piece of music that you could listen to. Handel's Messiah. It's pretty famous. But regardless, that's where that that text connects to it. Have you ever received a gift at Christmas that's, maybe it's one of those like larger gift bags or a big box and you open it and inside are a bunch of individually wrapped littler gifts. And so you keep pulling them out and there's more gifts to open and, and then there's this other little gift to open and so you keep pulling these out and it seems like there's never going to be an end to all these gifts. Every time you pull something out, there's another one underneath and You keep thinking, okay, I'm at the end, and then the person who gave it to you is watching with anticipation, and they're saying, no, no, keep looking. There's more in the bag, and and there's still something else that they're waiting for you to find. Well, that's what this verse is like. So this morning, we are going to, so to speak, unwrap the gifts of this verse together. And I believe this will encourage you if if you open the truths of this verse, of Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, it will bring a new meaning to Christmas for you, or at least add some depth as we keep going deeper and finding the next gift. In the first part of the verse, it tells us a child is born, a son. They didn't really expect the Messiah's story would include the importance of him being a child. 
the fragility of human life. They were looking for a hero who was going to overthrow the world government, who was going to put them in power. The King David who was going to to fight the Goliath and undo the the occupational uh, war and the people who were controlling them. They were looking for the all-powerful, holy, completely set-apart presence of God. And so it can seem odd to think of him as the baby in the manger, this little, fragile, human child. But that's the power of the story. The Messiah, God's anointed one, came as a real human child. He slept in a feeding trough for animals. He was surrounded by all the things associated with a stable. All the smells, the dirt, the mud. I haven't been in a lot of stables. Uh, We went and visited a reindeer farm in Washington once, but they cleaned it up for the visitors and the guests. So it wasn't too bad. My parents and my grandma actually were with us for that trip, for that visit. Uh, We got to pet the baby reindeer. It was a lot of fun. I've been in West Virginia where my grandpa at one time had probably 30 dogs and kennels, it feels like, and and I have smelled that smell. Um, And I have seen, you know, that kind of a farm, so to speak. But, But this feels a little different, doesn't it? And then as a baby, I mean, he needed fed. He needed diaper changes. I imagine that if Joseph and Mary weren't quick enough to meet the need, that he probably screamed or cried. And it's not blasphemous or sacrilegious to acknowledge that Jesus was a baby, a normal baby who needs his parents, who needs the things of life and who needs taken care of. And there are so many miracles that surround that first Christmas. And one of them is that This son of God came as a simple baby. The fullness of God, completely God, was in that baby. Jesus was not an angel. He was not just a vision or a far-off promise anymore. He was fully human and yet also fully God. How does that work? How can he be both? As we continue to open the gifts or the truths of this verse... Isaiah provides for us four famous descriptions of who the Messiah is and what the Messiah does for you. And these give us a picture, perhaps, of how he was God and man. The first one of these is that he comforts me. That's part of who he is. I was told last week that I went too quickly through my uh, slides, so I'm going to give you a moment if you are a note taker. That first one is, he comforts me. And it tells us, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. There is this supernatural comfort that goes beyond our understanding in that he is our wonderful counselor. Being human, he knows how I feel. Isn't that a miracle? That God was human enough to know how I feel, and yet... Being divine, he knows what I need. He's able to see both. Isn't that a wonderful truth that he understands the complete human experience, and yet he isn't limited in his humanity? I mean, I understand some human experience. I think I do a pretty good job with it, to be honest. It's one of the reasons I enjoy premarital counseling and encouraging people, because I feel like I, I do understand human struggle. And I know what it is to need help, but I don't know what everyone needs aside from Jesus. I don't have the divine perspective, but Jesus did. He was fully God, enough to know all of us. If we stop there, however, Jesus becomes like a a super therapist in the sky, if you will. He turns into sort of a life coach who always knows the best answer. And I think that we can get caught up as believers in that self-help view of messages at church or reading the Bible, seeking life advice and how we can live life better. And that certainly is one of the ways that Jesus speaks into our lives, but it has to go much further than that. If my sermons are only ever helping you know how to be a better you, 
then I'm kind of missing the mark because it's deeper. Because he also rescues me. He doesn't just comfort me. He rescues me. The text there in Isaiah 9 says he is our mighty God. The word mighty here in the Hebrew, one of the translations, one of the ways to understand this is a doer of great things. A doer of great deeds. If you think of biblical heroes that the people would have known, Moses, who helped bring the people out of Egypt. Joshua, who helped bring down the walls of Jericho and led the people. David, who was a wonderful leader in so many ways and fought so many battles. This is the image that the people would have. Okay, the mighty God. This hero who is going to fight and save and set us free, but but don't get stuck here on the mighty idea of a hero. Don't, don't think of Jesus as a, a pretty cool Spider-Man or Batman or whatever it might be. Because the fragility, the humanness of Jesus was part of his greatness. The heart of the Christian gospel is that God made himself fragile to rescue us. The vulnerability was part of his rescue mission. Many religions or mythology stories involve quests. A quest that a hero goes on or someone goes on to please the gods, to reach the gods, to appease the gods, or to try to become part God themselves. Christianity, however, I think is the only story I've come across where God goes on a quest to reach humanity where God goes on a quest to let go of the things that people seek after in order to reach people. How many of you have seen a lifeguard in action sometime in your life? Anyone? We have some lifeguards here who maybe have been the lifeguard in action. I've been to plenty of pools, even beaches where there are lifeguards, and if they see someone struggling, if they see someone and they think they're drowning, what do they do? They don't offer good advice. Hey, swim harder. (laughs) Try the dog paddle. It works. Do you know how to tread water? No. They jump to the rescue. They dive right in. They blow a whistle and they go right in as they're, it feels like as they're blowing the whistle. They go right in. It's amazing to watch because you don't even know something's wrong and they're in the water by the person almost immediately. And if we're not careful, the message of the church can sometimes seem like we're teaching people how to swim better. But the world doesn't need to know how to live better. They need to know that they are rescued, right? Now, yes, sometimes we need to know how to swim better because we have been rescued. But so many just need rescued. And the gospel isn't just good advice. The Christmas story isn't just a fun story. It's It's good news. The good news is that God sent his hero to rescue the world, to dive in immediately and save the people who needed rescued. And then he goes even further. We don't just need comforted or rescued. He adopts me. He adopts me. He he doesn't just comfort us and rescue us. He brings us into the family. I could ask Logan, because he's been our lifeguard, how many of them did you then invite home to dinner and and ask your parents to give a room? I mean, probably none, unless Alex was someone you had to save at some point, right? That's not usually how a lifeguard works. But he is the everlasting father. And we could go so many different directions with that, but for now, think of the best things that a father offers. Maybe compassion, compassion, or support. I mean, what are some of the things that a good human father provides? Just, you can shout it out. What are some good things that a good human father can provide? Guidance, love, leadership, discipline, a home, a hug, love, good directions, 
help, security. I'm surprised nobody said money. <laughs> Ethan's not here. Maybe that's why no one said it. Lately, the one who's the furthest away is the one who needs the most money. I know that not everyone has a great image of father. And there are many who may have had a difficult time growing up with an abusive father or an absent father, and so they hear these descriptions, and their own father doesn't seem to match this at all. And so when we talk of an everlasting father in this Christmas verse, it might be hard for some people to separate who their human father is and who the heavenly father is. And there may be a worry, is God just some omnipotent version of my terrible father? And in his all-powerfulness, he's able to do all the hard things that my father did forever. That doesn't sound great. But that's not what it is. What this means is that God is, the, is all the good things that your human father may have failed to be or should have been. And no human father is perfect. None of them. My dad came pretty close, but it's not Christmas yet, so I still have a chance. <laughs> God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will never hurt you. He will never forget you. Not for one second does he forget that you are his child. He loves you as the best father in the universe because he is everlasting we know his love <clears throat> excuse me is eternal because he is everlasting we always have hope we always have love we always have compassion you get the idea that his everlastingness means that all of the best things of a father are always who god is and he adopts me it is an everlasting adoption. I am forever his child because he adopts me. And then finally, he restores me. He brings restoration because he is the prince of peace. He is the prince of peace who restores me. And that's a big deal. That's a big part of this. And what is the Hebrew word for peace? I'm sure some of us know it, and I bet some of you know it once you hear it, even if you didn't know you knew it. But I'm sure some of you, what is the Hebrew word for peace? Shalom. Shalom. A good number of you knew it. Good job. We do have a lot of pastors in the congregation, so that helps. Say that word with me. Shalom. Shalom. Doesn't it almost have a peacefulness in just saying it? Kind of rolls peacefully off the tongue, right? Shalom appears over 200 times in the Hebrew scriptures. And it means much more than just the English word peace. We think of maybe the cessation of war or conflict. We think of, you know, peace is something where there's this absence of conflicts. But maybe we also think of it as like a feeling, you know, a, a serenity, like the Eagles song. I got a peaceful, easy feeling, right? Or it just has that background Jim Croce song and, you know, as as the montage of my life is peaceful, right? Maybe we think of it that way, but, but it's bigger than that. Pastor and Christian author Tim Keller uh, wrote this. He said it is a multidimensional, complete well-being. It's physical, it's psychological, it's social, and it's spiritual. And it flows from all of one's relationships being put right with God, with oneself, and with others. Another definition that I heard is that shalom is a total flourishing, wholeness, health. We may think of peace as a beautiful sunset or a, a serene setting, but peace, true peace, goes far beyond that. And do you know what the primary peace robber is? Now stick with me here, this, this connects I think we can know the true depth of peace by understanding this. One of the chief robbers of our peace is guilt. Legitimate guilt over sin that breaks our relationship with God. 
It robs us of internal, deep, lasting peace. It robs us of that wholeness, that health, that, that total flourishing of who God has called us to be. But the Prince of Peace can deal with that once and for all. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 uh, says this. I'm going to have you read this one. We... And then Colossians 3.15. One day, this Prince of Peace will restore total shalom, total peace to the earth. At the second advent, the return of Jesus, total peace will reign. Have you ever noticed when listening to or perhaps singing some of the Christmas hymns or carols that many of them speak of the second advent? Maybe you haven't caught it before, but so many of them are not only about the birth of Christ, but also about his return when he brings peace on the earth. For example, if you think of the words to joy to the world, get the lyrics in your mind, right? Joy to the world. It starts with, Jeremiah was a bullfrog, was a good, that's not right, that's not the right joy to the world, my bad on that one, I totally stole that from another pastor, so that was not my great wisdom there, no, the, the verse goes, the second verse, no more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground, he comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found, Far as the curse is found, far as, far as the curse is found. That's speaking of the next advent. Not only is he making his blessings flow here and now, but, but it extends to where the curse goes. All of the curse. The whole earth. And there will no more be thorns that infest the ground that was plagued by thorns because of sin. And the sins and the sorrows of this world will no longer grow because he's coming to change it all. Advent is not just about remembering the Christmas story. It's also about remembering my place in the story. And like we said last week, we live between the first Advent, Christmas, and the second Advent when he comes again. And that should give us some good perspective, some hope about where we are in the story and what it means for us in the midst of his story in our lives. Because God had a plan for that first advent. He was in control the whole time. From the moment sin entered the story in the garden with Adam and Eve, God was bringing about the first advent that we celebrate at Christmas. We talked about some of the details and the obstacles in Grow Deep this morning, how there were so many moments along the way that could have derailed the whole story. I mean, it could have started with just Mary saying, eh, I pass. <laughs> Thank you, but no. Or Joseph could have just said, I'm not the guy for you. Like, this isn't, whether he believed it or not, he could have just said, you know, I believe you, but, but that's not for me. And there were so many moments along the way that could have messed it all up. And yet, from that first sin in the garden, God was working this plan out. And so if he had that plan, if he, if he had all that detail and it all happened at the right time, at the fullness of time, when it was ready, he did this. I can trust and hope that he has the next one just as perfectly planned. And I can't read about all the details just yet. The Bible does have a lot of details, but, but I don't see all the details just yet. But, but I read about the other, and that's amazing how he made that work. How he brought all of that together to fulfill all those prophecies in a way that so many people did not expect. Well, I bet he can do the same thing again. In fact, he's writing that story. And I'm in the middle of it. But he's still in control. And it seemed like chaos for them, probably especially to Mary and Joseph at times. But he was in complete control. 
He was in all the details, and that's how I can know that this darkness will not last. Whatever the darkness feels like, whatever the difficulty is, wherever my life is, it won't last because I know that he's in the details and he's in the plan for the return. And as we remember that he will be called the Wonderful Counselor and Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, the question is, if this is everything in that gift bag, as we keep digging in there, if this is what the Messiah comes to give us, then how can I experience this in my life? Why do I not always experience this part of the promise? Well, let's go back to the part of the verse that you likely noticed when we skipped over. There's a part of the verse that we skipped that says, and the government will be on his shoulders. And yes, that means that one day, He's going to rule over all the earth. His kingdom will reign forever and ever with justice and love. But it also starts right here in my heart. When I place the government of my life, the leadership, the authority of my life upon his shoulders. When I allow him to rule in my life. In recovery, they talk about turning over control of my life to his power. You need to have a moment where you say, Jesus, I turn over control to you. Be my Lord. And maybe it's in a situation that you've held back. Maybe it's just your whole life. And then you begin to experience in increasing degrees all these things that we've talked about. All that this verse tells us is true. Have you seen this picture before? Maybe you have. This is from 2017. It was a story Uh, that was pretty famous. This is from a bridge in London, England. And these passers-by, you see a crowd kind of around one man, they held on to this man for two hours until he could be safely rescued. He was on this bridge, and he was attempting to commit suicide. He He was working up the courage to jump. Now, all these people who are hanging on to him, they are strangers, This isn't a group of people that was walking by, know all each other. They see this guy and they're like, hey, we should do this. No, this is individuals who notice a man that they don't know and they jumped to help. Isn't it somewhat miraculous that one of them there even had a yellow rope that he was just walking with? I don't usually carry a yellow rope and yet he had it and he wraps it around this man and they're hanging on Not for their own dear life, but for his dear life. There is a determination by these people to rescue this one man that they did not know. The message of Christmas and the message of this passage from Isaiah is that God is full of determination to rescue you. And once you realize that, once you take it in, that mission unites all of us like these strangers It unites us beyond all of our divisions. Whatever differences we have, the preciousness of human life, the fragility of human life that Jesus came to be part of to then save brings us together in a unique way. We talked about this in the Grow Deep today as well, that the Christmas season uniquely unites the church. And it uniquely unites the world. We give to charities more. We care about people who are in need in a different way at this season. It brings us together. If you want to get past the distractions and the divisiveness of the world around us, the simple answer is a united purpose. And Jesus Christ uniquely gives that to us. In fact, Jesus Christ is the only united purpose that brings people together in a real and lasting way, where we have this determination to rescue the preciousness of every life, because that's what Jesus came to do. I don't know everyone's darkness or difficulty. I mean, that's what we've been talking about, and and hopefully none of us feel like we're on that bridge, at least not physically, but I bet that there are people who emotionally or mentally 
we feel like we're really struggling. And maybe it's the kind of struggle that the blue service will help with, and maybe it's just the hard seasons of life or things that we're just dealing with. And, and the message is that Jesus came to rescue you, to provide comfort in the hard moments, to be what you need because he is all-powerful and he loves you, loves you enough to bring you into the family forever. And it doesn't end. So would you, as we go into prayer, would you say that phrase with me one more time? This darkness will not last. Believe that. The light of the world came to be the light in your life that sets you free from every and any darkness and rescue you from any and every situation. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the truth of your word that you are the wonderful counselor, mighty God, the everlasting father, and the prince of peace. And that you came to bring us a unique opportunity to receive your peace and hope and joy because you love us. Our prayer this morning, Lord, as we sing this closing song is that you would bring that peace into our lives and where there are areas that we need rescued, that we would see you. That we would trust that you were in the details then and you are in the details now and you are in the details yet to come. And though we can't see it, we can trust and we can hope that you are working in an amazing way. And that our story isn't just our story, it's your story. And like Mary and Joseph and the world that was in darkness, you came to be Emmanuel, God with us, wherever we are, with us. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Would you sing this last song with us?
It is the most wonderful time of the year, not because of the trees and the presents, well, one of the gifts, right? The gift of Jesus, that he comes to restore me to who I was meant to be, one of his children, his beloved, who is saved because he rescues each one of us. I love that that picture that we saw, the, the people rescuing this, this man, I bet that some of them were having a bad day. I would imagine some of them had credit card debt that they wish they didn't have or issues at home. And then all of a sudden, none of that mattered because there was someone's life who needed saved. That's who we are. We get to be like the angels who declare glory in the highest. Jesus is born and it matters for everyone. We get to rescue people. We have that yellow rope wherever we go, right? That Jesus saves. As you go about your week, you might not see someone on a bridge ready to jump, but I bet you see some people whose hearts are ready to just let go. Find a way to share the the lifeline of Jesus. However that might be, because at this time of year, people are willing to listen to it. I love Christmas. And I love the stories of Santa, but have you, have you heard the other story of Christmas, the, the bigger one, the reason why any of it matters? I'd love to bring you to my church. It's just a choir thing next Sunday. There's not even going to be this big sermon by the pastor. And the kids are going to be up there. I mean, it's fun, right? That's a great, you can steal that from me, okay? That wasn't even a good invitation. But that's, that's what we get to do, Amen. I love you, church. Have a blessed week. And again, next week, choir program. It's going to be awesome. I hope to see you. Calls you one and calls you all To gain his everlasting hall Christ was born for sin